what advice would you give to a young performer, a guy who's starting out that, that was trying to make it in any kind of music? Well, I don't know what I'd tell him without actually seeing what he do, what it is that he does. Mm -hmm. You know, because different different guys are different different ways. Uh, some people I would say, oh man, go out and get work work on your bottom line. Make it make sure you can do it by yourself, so that if the bass player doesn't show up, it ain't no catastrophe. You know, but uh, other guys, uh, I don't know. You know, if I've discovered that, that what I do is I get at home and I work with my tape recorder and everything like that and I play into the tape and then I listen to it back and then I play into the tape again and try to make it better and I said every once in a while I get up against the wall I say I can't go any further because I don't have any I just don't have the talent but I keep pounding away and grinding away at that wall until I discover a trick that allows me to go past that and also allows me to play that without having to practice it because now I know the trick of it. Can you give me an example of that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the reasons that you practice a lot is to get your notes real even. And once you discover that you can swing those notes, which is almost the same as dotting them, and that gives them the illusion of being real even, once you discover that, then you don't have to practice that anymore. You just swing. Whatever you play, you just swing them. There you go. As you save yourself hours and hours. Of time. Give me an example on an instrument here. Uh, okay, if you play like, uh, I don't know if I can do it without swinging it now because I mm -hmm. try to do it. But this, the C. Uh, now if I swing a. Gives it the illusion of being real regular, real regular, but it's not. But I mean, it saves you from having to. If you're playing just straight, you know, you might feel like you need to play hours and hours of that to make sure, you know, to keep that chopped, sensitive, and whatever mm -hmm. it is. But once you discover. discovered is, uh, this has just been recently, and boy, this has been a real breakthrough for me, is that uh, uh, it's not how hard you play, it's not how soft you play, it's how evenly you play. Evenly? Even, even, uh... Yeah, and if you play real evenly, by the, whoever's running the PA system or the tape recorder, they're always bringing it up. Roy Husky does that, he doesn't play near as hard as he looks like he's playing, but he plays real even. I've seen him in the studio working with him, playing with him making that VU meter come back to exactly the same place each time. So what does that say about dynamics? What do you do about dynamics? You don't. You what? You don't play with dynamics. It's the reverse. And I, I, would, I worried about that for a while because dynamics is such a part of it. And I heard Marco, overheard Marco Connor at the camp telling somebody, and I was kind of in the periphery of the conversation. But he basically was saying that uh, fiddle music and, and banjo music like that is kind of the reverse of classical music because it's rhythmic, so highly rhythmic. So it, it actually it actually almost asks that it not be played with dynamics. See? Yeah, that's yeah. And I'm sure that there's a certain amount of dynamics in it. There's probably a little bit of a little bit of that, but not a whole lot. Well you know how a lot of old time fiddlers uh particularly nowadays, but I think a lot of the old ones did too, would really accent the two and the four on the mm -hmm. up or the down stroke. Mm -hmm. So you're saying... Well, you could do that. I mean, that's going to come out anyway. But I mean, but I've found that if I play and try, if I try to keep everything the same size, you know, that, that it just works better. Mm -hmm. I get a better one. Now, I may discover another trick later on that that rescinds that, mm -hmm. that, that makes that invalid. But that's the latest thing, you know, latest little trick I discovered. 
Talk about uh, working with the tape. How, what you do with that? And well, you just come in here in the morning and yeah, and, uh, just talk I uh, I mash the little thing down which puts the counter on zero. I've got a work tape in there that says work tape on it and it says got the date on it. And uh, and then I play into it. And then I listen to it back and then after I've listened to it back it is ready to go again so I'll press the counter again to go to zero. Because I'll always wind back to zero. And, uh, and I, each time I listen to see what I'm doing and then I keep them all because oh, I have a, uh, a record of uh, what I'm doing, and eventually I probably recorded everything I've ever known somehow. So at least my music's not just going out of the air, disappearing. How long of a tape do you use for something like that? Uh, 45. I've got boxes and boxes of them. I guess you do. Oh, I've got hundreds of them. Yeah. For somebody to go through at some point, get a headache. <laughs> and do you just? Uh, Sort of just play what you're feeling like playing that morning. Or are you working on any particular piece day after day? Doesn't matter. It's a journal of whatever. It's it, it becomes a tape journal of whatever I'm. Uh, uh, I might just be playing a whim, or I might be working out a tune, or uh, I might just be working out a certain kind. Of, I've worked a lot on articulation, you know, uh, and I've been working on phrasing lately, and I might want to try a certain thing with my phrasing or whatever. And uh, maybe I want to try it on a certain tune or a certain thing, or does it make a difference being far away or close, or whatever? Uh, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you how I, re I re how I regard it. If you're a painter and you work on a canvas, that's one thing. You got the canvas stretched and you size it and you put the washes and the varnishes on it and everything like that and you paint. But most painters also work in a sketchbook. This is a sketchbook. And you just don't throw them away or record right. over them. That's right. the right. <laughs> kind of an amazing part. Well, they're, they're, they're not that expensive, and I figure, uh, I mean, it's my whole life, so I figure I just keep them. There's a bunch of them right here that are all. There's a bunch of them here that are stacked up. But I mean, I got boxes, you know. And then I run, uh, I run work tapes on all the uh, concerts. And a lot of times, if I go to a jam session, I'll record the jam session and go home and see how how I sound alongside other musicians and, and uh, how I sound uh, 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 in certain positions in the room and the microphone and with various things. You know, you do that with all your instruments, or yeah. mainly with the fiddle. Yeah, I mean, do yeah. that. With, yeah. Uh, I used to didn't do that, and, and I had friends that would tell me, oh, said I wouldn't want to punish myself that much. Then I decided to myself, well, if I'm going to get better, uh, I need to punish myself. And at, at first, uh, it was just awful. It was the hardest thing in the world to listen to it back, but I kept finding little things and finding little things, and it kept getting better. And it's still, I mean, I still uh, I hear a lot that, uh, that I could, that I'm, that I'm not doing, that I could be doing, but I also hear a lot where I've made, in my own mind, I've made progress. And in that way, it, it, you get hooked. It's, it's something you can get hooked on. It. Like a lot of times, if I'm not feeling really good, I'll come in here and work with my tape recorder for 20 or 30 minutes, and I'll just be feeling fine.